Lots of energy in the room. This is wonderful. Let's quiet down for a second. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, I'm Hank Paulson. I direct the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Center and the Alzheimer's Disease Center and the Department of Neurology. are really delighted to have Dr. Tia Powell here today to speak about dementia reimagined. Um, I think many of you know that uh, very recently Biogen looked at aducanumab again at their data. It looks like there might be a signal there. There's been so much excitement in the last week and a half about the possibility that this drug against amyloid has a modest, statistically significant effect. The reality is there's a lot of excitement, but they still don't have the therapies that slow down any of the dementias that are affecting so many Americans. And our talk today from Dr. Powell will address the many things beyond medicines that we need to be thinking about when it comes to dementia. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, about Tia. Uh, we were medical school classmates together. Uh, some of you medical students here? Maybe? Yeah. Well, and many of you were medical students. I think when I started medical school, it was like, I don't belong here. I'm not good enough. Man, these people are so smart. Some people really had their act together. T is the one who had her act together in our medical school. She graduated winning the highest honors, uh, the Frank Parker Prize for the highest excellence in the, in the class. She also won the prize, the Lewis Name Prize for thesis excellence. Uh, Look at my CV, you won't find anything like that. So she's been very good. She is the director of the uh, Center for Bioethics at Montefiore Einstein. She's also head of the uh, director of the Masters of Science in Bioethics program at Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, she received her training at Yale as well as a psychiatry training at Columbia. She's had a really interesting career that's included uh, phases as director of the task force uh, for New York State when it came to health issues. Uh, she spent some time in Japan as a, as a, pra as a private uh, practicing psychiatrist. Uh, she has been involved for years in many different programs that relate to uh, uh, healthcare, to uh, late life planning, to decision making in all kinds of disease, to, uh, to dementia, which has been a major focus. Among the awards she's won, uh, well, I think things that we don't think about. She's an, listed as a next avenue influencer in aging, which is, I've never heard that before. And uh, she also uh, was uh, listed as a, a rising, uh, uh, emerging person in medicine in New York City this past year. Uh, I will stop talking about Tia. We're delighted to have you here. She has a new book out, uh, Dementia Imagined, which will influence the talk today. For those of you who are interested, she will also be giving a reading at Literati Bookstore tonight at 7 o'clock. Uh, and we have really tapped her out here. We also have her speaking to our wellness initiative tomorrow. So it's a delight to have you here, Dr. Powell, and we look forward to your talk. It's really an honor. Oops. My one job was to turn on the mic. And I've struggled to fulfill that. Um, it is really an honor and a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Hank, for inviting me. Um, and um, let me jump in. So the talk will be a kind of a riff on the book. It will draw some themes from there. I will do some self-plagiarizing and take in also some new things from things I've thought about since then. So I have a kind of a mission. And this is my mission statement. I would like to change how we think about dementia, because I think if we think about it differently, we may be able to act differently in terms of dementia. And I don't mean just us individually as people. I actually think the way we think as a nation, uh, as physicians, I, I think our health policy really reflects some mistaken and unhelpful approaches to dementia, and I would love to see if we can move the dial on some of those. And in doing that, I would love to see if we cannot think about dementia as containing some joy and dignity. So here I will confess, I have given versions of this talk before, and to my certain knowledge, there will be people here thinking, it is really kind of dim because there is just nothing good about dementia. The only way that you could do anything good would be to cure it. Nobody doesn't want the cure for dementia. That would be awesome. We are really struggling with that one. And I am uh, it's sort of Debbie Downer on the subject of 
I do kind of have, I'm, I'm not <laughs> holding out great hope for it. There was a lot of effort to find that signal in that data. Um, there are a surprising number of people um, who um, feel that the only way they could respond to dementia is by thinking about suicide. So in the researching the book, I actually had the honor of speaking to lots of different people about dementia. And a surprising minority, when I asked them one of my set questions, which was, if you were to learn today that you met criteria for dementia, what would you do? A, a surprising number of people said, I would kill myself. So I don't judge. I understand that that might be the right solution for people, but it troubled me. And it makes me think about, could we not do better? Could we not have better things to offer people? Um, so, and I'll, I'll steal a story. Um, I do know uh, dementia is hard. There are people that really roll their eyes and say, you just have to stop with the joyful dementia thing. It's just idiotic. Um, my grandmother had um, dementia, and so ultimately did my mother. But I'll tell you quickly a story about how I came to be interested in thinking about dementia. Years ago, um, they've both passed away since then. Years ago, my mother was caring for my grandmother who at that time had very advanced dementia. And they were on the little screen porch of my grandmother's house outside of Washington, DC. And my mother was an incredibly good daughter, she's slaving away, she's trying to get her mother all comfortably situated. So she gets her from the bed to the chair, and she takes her out onto the porch on a warm day, puts her feet up, puts the little Afghan knitted blanket around her and gets the pillows all fluffed up on this nice porch and says, you know, ever the good daughter, there, mother, how is that? And my grandmother hadn't spoken then for many, many months, and you could see her face working. You could see her struggling to come up with something, a word, digging and digging to find a word that would do the work of all words. And as her face worked, she finally said, lousy. So... For me, that was, you know, incredibly heartbreaking. My mother was so disappointed. It really hurt her feelings. She was trying so hard. But it was an absolutely correct observation. If you just had one word that had to kind of cover the whole picture, that was a pretty good one. So really, there were no winners here. And it really, for me, was a kind of story that provided a, a framework for, does it have to be so lousy? Can we not do something better, and not that great people are working on this problem, but we are not, we are not there yet. So that is sort of the arching narrative, really, of how I happen to pivot in my work in bioethics to think about dementia. Well, here's some other not so joyful facts about dementia. There's an unbelievable failure rate for dementia research, 99.6%. That is almost a complete shutout. So, and it's way worse. Cancer research has a much higher success rate for that in terms of thinking about um, trials for medications and even devices and things. As we know, there's a big lag between the symptoms of dementia and the pathology that causes common types of dementia, such as Alzheimer's. There's also a big lag between having a great intervention and being able to get that out to people. And if you add the first lag and the second lag, the answer to that equation equals no treatment really successfully for the baby boomers, in my view. So that's my ultimate Debbie Downer view. Our brains have changed enough. The lag for any kind of successful intervention is enough. It's not coming for me. So then I better get busy and think about, you know, what can we do if we can't cure? I hope we can. I hope for the uh, younger people in the audience, for you, for your kids, I hope there will be effective interventions, but that's not going to work for me. So what else can we think about? Well, I'm going to, this is, this is the uh, meanest part of the lecture. I'm going to talk about the amyloid hypothesis, the poor old amyloid hypothesis. I hate to kick it while it's down, but it is definitely um, pretty far down at this point. We have been working away on this brilliant, brilliant people. This was the major theory, not the only theory, but this was this sort of causal, you know, hook. This is what we were going to do. This was going to take us there. If you could just decrease amyloid, you could stop or delay or reverse Alzheimer's. And it has not yet worked. 
thousands and thousands of people in trials. 2,000 people here, 1,800 there, another 2,000 over here, $400 million for this trial, 300 for that one. Lots and lots of money, lots and lots of people. It hasn't yet worked. The trial that now is going forward to um, request approval from the FDA was initially rejected. So it took, as I said, a lot of scrambling to sort of say, well, maybe if we kind of push the data here and prod it there. I don't know if that will work or not. I hope it does, but there have been so many disappointments that I think it would be a bad bet to bet on this. I think that's, for me, unlikely to happen. So why did we, why did we stick with this? It's an interesting question. Uh, for me, it really raises some interesting, some very hard questions about science. And I, I speak particularly to the students here. Um, there was a psychologist from the 1930s named Gordon Alport who came up with a concept called functional autonomy. And it's essentially when something that was once a means to an end becomes an end in itself. So Alport, like many of us in medicine, used to do a lot of work with small mammals, little teeny mice, little teeny rats. And he would train um, his mice to follow an extremely elaborate pathway and find the cheese. Train them, train them, train them, they would get there. Then after a while, he would take the same group of experimental mice and he would show them a little trap door, a little secret pathway. Buddy, look, without all those turns and twists, you can get right there, take half the time, it'll be great. And some of the mice would do that. They would adapt that pathway and they would get there and they'd have the cheese, quick trip, no problem. But some of the mice wouldn't do that. They would learn the shorter route, and they wouldn't like it. They wouldn't stay with it. They would go back to the longer route because it was what they knew. It's where they started. It's what they'd always believed in. We are that mouse. That is how we operate, a lot of us, a lot of the time. It is very hard to walk away from the path that you've learned, that the one, that's the one that's familiar. Even when we're smart, we do it. Even when we have pretty good evidence that there might be another path or that this path isn't working for us. So to really be scientists, we have to really sometimes be able to take a step back and say, I'm not sure we're there. I'm not sure we're heading in the right direction. And it's unbelievably difficult to do it. But I think that that is, we are at that kind of crisis moment in looking at dementia. There are lots of other people um, moving through this, but I want to tell you about an early one. This is one of the great uh, pleasures of writing the book is that a, you know, a wise editor said, you know, the, the history stuff, it looks kind of interesting. Why don't you check that out a little more? So I completely went down the rabbit hole. I read every issue of the American Journal of Insanity, great title. I don't know why they later they switched it to the American Journal of Psychiatry. I thought the original much better. Um, but it starts in the 1800s, it goes through. It is mind bending. I had to limit myself to one on off topic article per day because it was just like, whoa. Um, so. In reading that, I came across the work of this gentleman, and I really got fascinated by him. So to tell the story more succinctly, Solomon Carter Fuller was the grandson of American slaves who had escaped from slavery, got themselves to Liberia. And he was a very ambitious young man. When he came to be an older teenager, he thought, I need a serious education. Couldn't do it in Liberia at that time. He comes back to the US, and he gets himself into what we now think of as one of the historical black colleges, which were not all that historical in 1890. Um, they were relatively new in their time. Gets himself through college, smart, ambitious. He wants to go to medical school. He gets into BU, um, which you know he was the only African-American for miles before and miles after to graduate from BU. Incredibly ambitious. He goes off, he gets a job with great difficulty because there were no laws even contemplated to protect minority hiring. That was literally not a concept that had occurred to anybody. He starts doing autopsies because people don't want to do that, but he does. He's really curious. What is the connection between what your brain looks like and what you're doing and what your symptoms are? It's fascinated him. And he gets a job at a mental institution because again, they were hiring, he gets there. 
not enough for him. He does hundreds of autopsies. He gets a mentor and he says, what does the best trained physician in America need to do? You need to go to Europe because it's early. We didn't have the same kind of training they did. So he applies and he wins essentially a postdoc fellowship to go study with Alzheimer. So off he goes. Um, and he is working in German. He's one of five people selected that year. Unbelievably competitive global competition to get there. Spends several years, um, comes back. And when Alzheimer publishes the paper that is now famous, he's probably the person in America that is best situated to figure out what's up with that. And he writes his response. He writes some beautiful papers, which are completely unlike anything else in the American Journal of Insanity. Each one looks like a dissertation. Beautiful photographs, micro photographs from his microscope, drawings, all kinds of stuff. And he basically says, respectfully, I'm going to have to disagree. I've looked. I've done this study. I did autopsies on people who had what they determined then to be dementia, no plaques. He found lots of plaques in people who clearly didn't have dementia. He just doesn't think that there's an equivalence. He just doesn't see it. Very respectfully, I'm not buying this stuff with the plaques. 1911. I read an article this week that said, you know what's totally weird? We don't think there's a perfect connection between having amyloid plaques and the symptoms of dementia. It's like, are you kidding me? It's really, you know, we've had this problem. In any case, I get off my plaque, but this guy is totally fascinating. I really, that was the greatest gift of doing this work. So where are we now? Now it's actually a very exciting time. Lots of people doing great work, thinking about what, what, what are we doing wrong? What else do we need to do? What do we need to think about? I know there's lots of great work here. I know Dr. Paulson is working on ubiquitin. You are in my slide every time I, every time I give a variant of this talk. And I think we will learn more about how all the different pieces of cerebral dysfunction fit together to lead to different kinds of dementia and to do something about it, but we are not there. There is some really important piece that or pieces probably because this is almost certainly multifactorial that we need to work on. So the thing then is for today, we don't have a cure. That shouldn't mean no hope, although for many people, including many physicians, I think it comes across that way. I can't fix you. So I have nothing to offer you. I would like us not to think about it that way. I would like a different way of, of approaching. I think we have care. We are beginning to know what good care for people who actually have Alzheimer's looks like. I agree, it's not a cure. Cure would be better. We don't have that, and it's not coming today. But we actually do know something, though it's not as widely available as it should be. A lot of people with dementia do not get good care. I wish they did. I wish we could scale up what we know to do things better. And I wish we could revise the standard in a better direction for people with dementia. This is a picture, by the way, of my mother. Um, I used to think that was her wedding day, but I realized from the date on the back that she's only 13. <laughs> um, so I think this is her uh, confirmation. Um, and my mother didn't have a terrible experience with dementia. But again, part of my motivation is to say that my family, the six kids in my family, we had to kind of discover everything for ourselves. And the weight of that effort is repeated thousands, millions of times across the country every day, where people are trying to figure out, what, what do you do? I don't know how to do this. What, what's, the, what's the approach here? I would love to be able to make that pathway smoother. So what care do we need? I really, a lot of people, when you ask them what does dementia look like, they'll come up with the picture of someone at the very end stage, someone who's bedbound, somebody who's mute, somebody who's incontinent. But by definition, most people with dementia are in the earlier phase. You've got to get through that before you get to the end. So most people with dementia are in the community. They're next to you in the grocery store, in a restaurant. They're trying to get through, figure out what they need to do. And it's that the group of people in particular. We, we do also need good care for the end of life in dementia. But I think, really, people who are up and about and are feeling the struggle and the pain of it, I would love to see us think more about what we can do. So now I'm going to show you uh, some comments from a true expert in dementia, Lonnie Schicker. You see all those initials after her name. She was an education, is an education expert. And she's also a person living with dementia. <laughs> who gave these comments at an NIH summit just about two years ago, 
where they're thinking about, you know, what are the, what do we think we need to do here? So if I can get this to work right, I'm not at all sure that I can. I don't have a mouse. I need help from the. Well, he did, but I had a different setup then. I don't have it here. Mm. I need my little, there we go. Keyboard is crucial. Thank you. Recently, a friend yeah, of mine. Yep. Oops. And I can put it back. Recently, a friend of mine. announced it, all of her friends rallied and called her. When I told people that I have the people are always at a loss for words when I tell them that friend, some family member. Despite my efforts to stay in contact with them, I don't know why I really don't understand it, the many of us. I believe that people are afraid of the disease and stay away, whether intentionally or unintentionally, of the Those who are with me, with me, no doubt will continue to be. The rotating time for appointments, engaging me socially, there is because we all it will only be mine is inevitable. Obstacles are immense. I have had intense. Get lost, don't understand money. I have more increasing inability to address my own psychosocial. Because of this, I have seen my loving, devoted cry out of. But with the support of those around. We've been able to get through. It truly takes a village, and I'm lucky to have you. Recently, a friend of no. <laughs> so I find her um, words very moving. I'm sorry, by the way, that the audio visual is out of sync. It seems to do that every other time. Um, but I think she really speaks very um, straightforwardly, very sincerely about how difficult it is. And if I think about what I'm seeing in terms of training, a lot of that is not what we are offering to young clinicians to sort of try and help people. We have a lot of tasks to do. We can't do everything for everybody. But I think there is a misalignment today for many, many patients in terms of what we're offering and what they feel they need. So there are a lot of people, almost 6 million people today in the US with dementia and certainly many millions more globally. A lot of them have dementia today. Many more will have it tomorrow. If we can't figure out how to support that group, how even to produce and permit happiness for that group, they won't be happy. And for me, I say, I won't be happy because I assume I'm gonna be there. So what to do? This is a slight detour. One of the um, projects that's very interesting to me that I'm involved is, and I'm chairing a committee for the National Academy of Medicine, which has, they're not good with titles. Really, they don't really love a catchy title. So that's the title, the Decadal Survey of Behavioral and Social Science Research on Alzheimer's Disease and Related Dementias. What that means is that they want us to make a roadmap for the next 10 years of what kinds of social behavioral science research there should be to help people with dementia and their um, 
caregivers and supporters. It is essentially a response in some ways to an, a kind of upcry about you're only pushing for the uh, cure. You have not done NIH and other groups. You have not done sufficient in terms of thinking about care. What can we do today for people who actually have dementia? Among the experts um, that are consulting with the committee are people living with dementia, people who have lived as caregivers, who are thinking about um, we don't want to only, do, we are making recommendations about research, um, and yet we don't want these to be purely academic. We want to make sure that the problems we're addressing are really the ones that people have. Um, there, we, the committee has reached no conclusions, um, but we've seen in the public um, part of it so far some really interesting observations. One of the main ones that I really want to ask you to help me think about is that the diagnostic process for so many people with dementia is really flawed. It's flawed on the technical level, of course, for a lot of people. Not everybody is coming to the University of Michigan. We know that there's a lot of misdiagnosis. A lot of people um, with frontotemporal dementia are told they have Alzheimer's disease. More and more now, that's a diagnosis that's being made, but it was almost certainly missed for many, many people in prior generations. Um, but I'm not actually focusing on that. I do think um, even you know, out in the community, lots of different people are learning to make the diagnosis of dementia. But what, uh, what troubles me and what we've heard from, from a lot of people with dementia who've come to the committee to talk about their experience, is that they're going to major medical centers, not this one, they go to fancy major medical center A, and somebody says, we've done all these tests, we've looked at everything, you meet criteria for dementia, here's what you should do. You can take these medicines, we don't think they'll help much. You can enroll in a study, and maybe you should make a will, and I'll see you in six months. And people are devastated by this. I'm not saying these are uncaring physicians, of course they're caring physicians, but our model is insufficient. It really leaves people totally devastated. They don't know how they should live. And as physicians, we're not in the business of telling people how they should live, but we do have some larger obligation to the people who come to us in need. Figure out, well, if I can't do it, I mean, how shall I, how shall I connect you? How shall I do more? Um, how can we, in fact, you know, support you? So some of the people that have been coming to the committee and that I've been hearing from over the last year is to really begin to think of cancer care as a model. So cancer starts from a different place than the treatment of dementia. A lot of cancer treatments, particularly in prior years, were brutal. So the actual experience of getting treated for cancer, even when it was successful, was incredibly harrowing. It was painful, it was frightening, you were very isolated, you were on immune precautions, separated from your family, particularly terrible for little children. So people treating cancer began to think about, apart from the medicine, we need to do something to make people not feel traumatized should they survive. We need to do something more here. So now, you know, if you talk to people and they get a cancer diagnosis, their family, if they're in a great cancer center, their family is invited to like support groups, they get all kinds of stuff. The cancer, the person with cancer is often invited to do, you know, various things to connect them with other people all kinds of sort of healing treatment, even some alt treatments, that doesn't have to be your thing, but there's a notion that the illness itself is one part of the problem, but your experience of it and surviving that is another one. And we have a big problem with this in dementia. It's unbelievably isolating, it's terrifying. Old age is in itself isolating and fairly terrifying. But when you add to that dementia, the social stigma is unbelievable. Even in a nursing home, they don't want you around. There are all these separated things. Get those people who can't do stuff anymore so I don't have to look at them. They're too scary for me. So we're really erasing and making invisible people with dementia. It's that issue that I think we do have some technology. We don't have the technology today to get a cure, which would be fantastic. But we could do a lot better job of thinking about what is it like for you with dementia? Can I not help connect you with somebody, even if I, as a physician, don't have a curative strategy? Can I not connect you with a group of people who may be able to help lift with this burden? Um, I'll also add that, unfortunately, because of the lack of cure in dementia, there is plenty of room for charlatans. 
And our lack of embrace of the person with dementia leaves the door wide open for charlatans. So there are lots of people who will sell you supplements that don't work, who have whole programs, who will say, I can cure dementia, you know, come to my clinic, come to my program. And people for a time go to those places and cough up unbelievable amounts of money. And maybe some have a kind of placebo effect. There's no data to suppose that there actually is something curative in any of this stuff. But they're there in part because we didn't really offer to accompany them. We didn't really offer them an evidence-based, thoughtful, non-destructive option. So I'm sure many of you um, working in the field have come up with people that have been to some of these clinics and sort of tried it out. They're there because I think we've missed an opportunity that I would love to see us take up. And I actually um, have to say, I think this is one of the places that's really acting on that. I think actually there are very exciting things here happening within the dementia framework, that there really is um, great work in terms of reaching out and wellness and stuff like that. I have to tell you, I don't think that's the model everywhere. That is not what's happening across the country where people are going to all kinds of big and fancy, great places where there's fantastic research and they get this devastating, yes, you have dementia, see you in six months, you're kind of on your own. Um, that is really heartbreaking for a lot of people. So how are we gonna do this? What are we gonna do? I will say that actually in lots of domains, not just in dementia, social support and interventions actually make a huge difference in health outcomes. That is indeed, as the fantastic book, The American Healthcare Paradox points out, that's why so many other countries have better health outcomes than we do. We spend way more money than anybody on acute care, but if, and our health outcomes famously are kind of crummy. If you add the social support spend plus acute care, we come out kind of in the middle and that matches pretty well with our health outcomes. If you add that up though, a lot of other countries spend so much more on social services especially countries that have universal health care, the UK, Scandinavia, most of Europe, um, that they actually, including for people with dementia, have a much better quality of life and better health outcomes. So things like caregiver support actually make a huge difference. That's pretty effective. Um, there's a very interesting researcher at NYU named Mary Middleman, who has done the NYU caregiver um, intervention which has been tried in lots of countries in many different states. Um, and it basically makes people feel better, live safer, and saves a lot of money for the state. Who doesn't like that? Um, so it allows people to stay home safely for a little bit better than a year in lots of different places, a fairly simple intervention. But uh, New York State loves this thing. They've just put in, in a couple of years ago, $75 million to try and scale it up across the state, the state and see if they can get um, uptake by supporting caregivers. Can they help people stay home where they say they'd rather be, be safe and put off nursing home placement? Um, and it seems to work. There's other great programs around John Hopkins, Mind at Home, also very similarly, um, is really helping people stay home. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. I'm just thinking about, you know, what is good care? It obviously looks different at different stages. Um, I'll go more quickly. Music, as we all know, is one of the kind of successes in terms of dementia for reasons that are certainly unclear to me. Uh, maybe other people here can help us understand why. The parts of your brain that um, deal with music are beautifully built. They actually are really resilient. People who cannot speak readily um, can still sometimes not only appreciate but actually make music. There are people, and you may have seen films of them on you know, uh, public television or whatever, where there will be somebody who hasn't spoken in a long, long time, but used to sing a cappella a million years ago in college. And if you put them in front of a group of people and turn the music on, all of the lyrics will come out perfectly preserved. And is singing you know, the songs of his youth and clearly looking joyful. It actually is very powerful. So this group, The Unforgettables, is a chorus in New York for people with dementia and their caregivers. Um, and you can't actually tell who's who, which is part of the beauty of it. And when you hear them sing, it's actually quite magical. They really look incredibly happy. They're by no means the only people doing it. This kind of chorus is really popular. It's a fabulous thing to do. It gets the people with dementia out of the house. It reconnects the caregiver with other people. 
Um, and it is a source of joy, and those are not so easy to come by. Um, but for the right people, it actually makes a huge difference. So it's very moving. Um, I am guessing you guys have one here, too. As dementia develops, there are other things that are really tricky. Um, guns, it's very hard for us to talk about guns in America, which is puzzling because we have more guns than people, famously. Um, I don't know why it's hard for us to talk about what they mean in our society, but it is. It is. Also, driving is tricky. Um, I won't go at length into those, but I will say um, that just recently I came across a website, and there are a few others that do this, but I think this is actually a fantastic use of technology. The emergency department at University of Colorado has put together a very user-friendly website where you can walk through and ask questions. There's a whole section on guns and a whole section on driving. So it says, do you have guns in the house? Who has the guns? Do you feel safe with the guns in the house? Do you feel that the, who has access to the guns? Does the person with cognitive impairment have access to the guns? Are we okay with that? Are we worried about that? What are some options to do? Who would safely be able to watch the guns? What can we do about it? It's very non-judgmental, but it's a conversation that relatively few people, number relative to the number of people with guns, have had. And actually, we really need to go there. So good for them for doing this. And they have a similar kind of um, you know, pathway that you can do with driving. Who has that? Do you have a car? Who has access to the car? Who's driving the car? Is that okay? Um, so but they sort of take you through. And it's clearly something you can do with somebody with dementia um, next to you and sort of work your way through. Will it make these questions easy? It will not. But we have surprisingly few readily available resources to families who are trying to figure out a way to discuss these issues. And people are really worried. So good for these guys. I think this is fantastic. It's a, and I'd actually love to see more of this around. Another issue is sexuality and dementia. How do we like help support people with this? Um, sexuality is one of the things that defines adulthood. When you get to be grown up, you get to make risky choices. That's kind of the good part of being a grown up. And in, in, we kind of like some of these choices around driving, around money, around sexuality, because they're dangerous. So it's very hard to suggest to somebody that this aspect of adulthood, we will now claw back from you. It was a very painful discussion for a lot of people. So how do we deal with this? And let me, let me tell you about some of the cases um, and some of the problems. So there's definitely a bias that people with dementia are all asexual, or maybe that they should be. Old people shouldn't be sexual. That's terrible. Who wants to think about that? Ugh. So um, you know, the fact of the matter is that sexuality is variable among the old as it is among the young. Um, people are really uh, different one from another. But I find these stats actually very interesting. Among people who have dementia and live at home and have partners, 59% of the men and 51% of the women report being sexually active. That's actually interesting. Do the men have male partners? Do men report sexual activity, but it's not happening? Do women have sexual activity, but don't report it? Why are those numbers different? It's really interesting. Um, I don't know, but nonetheless, the numbers are not small. Even up into the 80s, um, a significant uh, percentage, 41% in this large study, report that they're sexually active. But here's where we come in. If you look at the number who have ever discussed sexuality with their physician, whoa, 1% of women. 1% of that 51% of women who report sexual activity when there's somebody other than themselves or someone else, a partner in the home. So is that a problem? Can be. Let's think about some stories. Here's one that unfortunately you've probably all heard about because this went sort of globally around on the internet, which is a related tragedy. Um, Henry Rahans was a 78-year-old Iowa state legislator. He was widowed. Donna Liu was also um, widowed. Um, and they married then, so it's a second marriage for each. After a few years, she develops dementia. Um, she is put into the nursing home by her daughters. This is a blended family. And um, he then subsequently is arrested for having sex with his wife in the nursing home. She was not in any way you know, crying out or anything like that, but they decided that this was wrong because she must be 
like a cognitively impaired minor and not have the capacity to consent to sexual activity. So that's a little odd. She's still married. She's still an adult. She had capacity when she married and when she was already an adult. So how do we know that she doesn't have that capacity? Are we getting this right? So this is kind of the old school. I think some years ago, people just assumed sex bad. That shouldn't happen with dementia. Don't, don't permit that. Don't think about that. And more recently, people are going, I'm, I'm sorry, why is that? I'm not, how, how do you know that? Um, so it begins, uh, it, this really sort of began a national conversation. There were other people, some nursing homes have had, long had policies around how they're going to evaluate capacity to consent for sexuality, even in the context of dementia. Others were like, not doing that, not going there. But I think there are now more nursing homes that have really taken a step back and thought about what's appropriate. So what you really need to do in this case is not to assume that somebody can't consent, but really think about um, what has the person spoken to without judgment alone say about this? Do they seem to need protection? Are they requesting protection against sexuality? Does this look like this is predatory? Does it look like there's a quid pro quo? Or does it look like this is a voluntary engagement? Um, and those conversations, actually, I think we're really going somewhere. The VA, actually, um, has been a real leader in this, has really sort of tried to think about we're not so sure that it's appropriate to do things to prevent sexual interaction among either patients or their, or, or their visitors. And they actually have some visitation centers, uh, weirdly enough, like you do in prison, where people can have sort of conjugal visits. Because the nursing home can be like a prison, and that's not right. I'm not sure that prisons should be exactly the way prisons are, but I'm pretty sure that nursing homes should not be. So these conversations can be very helpful to a person with dementia who maybe needs protection, to make sure that this is not a predatory activity. It's not so helpful to the caregiver without dementia who might need the same help. So here's a de-identified example, but this is one that has come to our clinic um, quite a few times, and which I fear may be more common, but because we don't talk to caregivers about this, we wouldn't know. So here's an older woman who lives at home and is a caretaker for her husband. He gets very agitated, and in that agitation, there are demands, sometimes violent, actually, for social, sexual interaction. This was going on for way more than a year before she ever felt she could talk to anybody about it. She was terrified. She didn't want her husband taken out of the house. She didn't want to lose her house. She didn't want to be alone. She loved her husband. So this was very burdensome to her and very frightening. This is really an issue that is hard to find in the literature, and I think we don't talk to people about it, but seriously, there's every reason to think she's not the only one. There are a lot of older people who are, you know, and all sorts of people are uncomfortable talking about sexual activity, and particularly with a beloved partner, when this is a shift and it looks really offensive. It's really a, a hard thing to say about somebody that you care about, that they have changed in this way that you no longer feel sexually safe with somebody to whom you may have been married to for decades and decades. That's a hard thing to say. And we, I think, have not been helpful enough in helping people normalize that discussion and figure out what's to do here. How can we make you feel safe, and how can we figure out a pathway that would genuinely be helpful? So that's what I mean about people who have dementia, and they are living with it, and they could use our help and by this, I mean the whole interdisciplinary team. We could use our noggins to do some things that we haven't really fully tackled yet. So, you know, there's all this inappropriate sexual behavior. So what would appropriate sexual behavior look like? Well, truly, there can be appropriate sexual behavior in dementia. It's a basic human need. There's nothing about dementia that would make you not be able to feel lonesome or to wish for intimacy or affection or touch, um, so that there can be appropriate sexual activity. And it's clear that some people are able to get there. It's not true for everybody, but we really need to kind of rethink our notion that you know, as health professionals, we need to stop this, put an end to that right now. That's not our portfolio. Nobody really asked us to do that. Well, maybe the adult children of the blended family did because it makes them uncomfortable, um, but uh, really, that's not probably the best use of our 
of our services. So what to do? It's a really, it's a tough question. Um, one is just to be sort of more open about sexuality for all different core uh, categories, age, disability. Um, it certainly can be appropriate. You do need to think about, some people do need protection, absolutely need protection in the sense of we don't want them to be victimized. We don't want there to be a quid pro quo or something that's unwanted. That probably works better in a nursing home where there's less privacy, but it's easier to protect vulnerable people. Um, although there are other people who say, don't protect my rights away. I'm still an adult. I should still be able to do adult stuff. Um, it's harder to figure out what to do in the community where there is more privacy, and therefore it's harder actually to look after people who are vulnerable. So this is a thing that I think we need to begin to discuss. Um, I will tell you, we don't, with older people, do the question, the kind of questioning that we're trying to make routine now in regular visits. Like now you go to the doctor, you're supposed to be asked, and we often are asked, you know, do you feel safe at home? Um, recently, my husband who plays soccer broke his nose. So I actually took him to the emergency room where I work. You know, he's in his like soccer uniform, with blood pouring out of his face. He looked like a giant five-year-old. And um, we go to the ED on Sunday morning, and the uh, intake nurse very appropriately looks at him and says, while I'm standing next to him, and he has blood coming out of his face, do you feel safe at home? So um, he looked at me, and 35 years of marriage, I know exactly what he's thinking, which is, this would be so much fun. And, and he looks back at her and says, yes, I do feel safe. Thank you. So we do need to ask that question. It's awkward. It can be really tough. Um, but we probably need to ask it yet more broadly than we have thought to do so far. Um, so that would be a start. It's not a solution, but it might be a start. So, um, you know, just quickly to summarize, there are new scholars who are thinking about this um, and basically saying if you, if you assume that a person with dementia should, either is or should be asexual, then any behavior is deviant. We should stop that. That's what a good healthcare worker does. But a newer approach is to think, actually, my duty to support the right to benefit from all of the things that grown-ups get to do, including sexuality, and that maybe we have misdefined autonomy as based too exclusively in cognition and in reason. Maybe we need to be more respectful for those, including for those who have cognitive impairment, and think about autonomy as basically including affective um, wishes, preferences, all kinds of things that actually do express the continued personhood of that person with dementia, even if they cannot give you a sort of reasoned set of arguments. So we may have overthought what autonomy really looks like for some of our patients. So I'll quickly, um, when, are, when are we due? Okay, I'm gonna speed through this, which is too bad. Um, I will say if you take away only one thing, I hope you will remember that feeding tubes in late stage dementia are not helpful. Um, we used to recommend them, more than 90% of people with late stage dementia have difficulty swallowing, and the and this conventional wisdom used to be something along the lines of, your mother can't swallow anymore, she has to have a feeding tube or she will die. A more honest discussion is your mother is in the final stage of dementia when most people have difficulty swallowing. Ideally, we talked about this at the beginning, so we know her preferences and yours about what we should do. But if we haven't, let me tell you, I don't recommend the feeding tube. It does not improve quality of life. It actually decreases it considerably. At a population level, neither does it increase length of life. People with a feeding tube are more likely to be restrained, are more likely to be left out of the dining room in the nursing home because it's too much trouble to move them. Um, really, why don't we consider comfort feeding? And actually, if you as a family member would like to do that, you can do a pretty quick training so that you're capable of doing that. And it's a lovely thing, actually, to be able to have that human contact and to do the feeding. That's what we recommend. So please consider that. Um, there are a lot, we could do a much, much better job on end of life care, but I will feed through that, I'll say a word about aid in dying. All those states that permit aid in dying have essentially the same model legisla uh, legislation, which says that you have to have current capacity to make a decision and less than six months to live. So those two things can never happen in dementia. 
you either have more than six months prognosis or you don't have current capacity to decide. So there is no state now where aid and dying can apply to, de can apply to dementia. I think that's personally unlikely to change because that's the winning formula. All those states that are pushing and trying to get aid in dying also exclude everybody with cognitive impairment. Um, so I think that's unlikely to happen. I, I, don't, I don't judge. As I say, I think that can be perhaps the right choice for somebody. Um, but the, the picture, who, does anybody know what that's from? Does anybody recognize this movie? Yes, Chicken Run. So when my kids um, were little, it was in the ancient days where you couldn't like stream stuff. We actually owned specific videos, which they then would watch like 500 times. So there was a time when I knew every word in this. So the deal in Chicken Runs is that the chickens are trapped on this chicken farm. They know no good is coming out of this. Um, and the leader chicken is trying to pump up the troops. And she says, we're going to die free chickens or die trying. And the stupid chicken who gets all of the good lines says, are those the only choices? So this is how, you know, I, aid in dying, I am a psychiatrist, suicide has always been there for some people as a choice, but I hope it's not the only one. I hope we could offer something that would be better, that would make people feel like, if I could do that, that would be okay, I would try that. All right, so dementia is really scary. It's the illness famously that frightens Americans more than any other, more than AIDS, more than cancer, and it is a serious illness. But we add an enormous burden of stigma that makes it so much harder. It doesn't have to be that scary. So I'd love to see us try and create a future that will offer at least the possibility of joy and dignity in a life with dementia. And that is it. Thank you very much. for a few questions. Huge. We should totally do that. That's actually one of the few bright lights, and it's actually really interesting. There are more people still with dementia, but because there's so many more older people, if, um, if you look at the cohort of 80-year-olds, 90-year-olds, the percentage of people with dementia is actually going down, and it looks like that's because of improvements in cardiovascular care, treating blood pressure, all kinds of things like that. It certainly doesn't work for everybody, but it is one of the few bright lights, and interestingly, even though we often um, try to separate vascular dementia from Alzheimer's, in fact, the overall rates are going home. Weirdly, treating blood pressure seems to affect Alzheimer's disease. What is up with that? So, I mean, it's really, for me, quite mind boggling, but definitely we've had much better success with le changing lifestyle factors, treating blood pressure, particularly frankly, in countries that do a better job of that kind of thing than we do. It's awesome in Scandinavia. We need to actually really think about that better. I don't think it will prevent all Alzheimer's, but it's clearly already making a dent. So we do have the success, and that's all in the non-farm, or at least not dementia farm. Um, it's more like the, treating the vascular risk factors. It's really incredibly interesting. So there are definitely things that are helpful. They're all in this cardiovascular thing. There's the best data probably for exercise. Doesn't have to be at an Olympic level, but general fitness, maintaining an active life, there's the best data for that. I believe that diet also makes a difference, but the data on diets are really hard to come by. It was seen with our dietary guidelines, it's incredibly difficult to get really solid data. You got to study somebody for a really long time and ask them what they ate every day. And people lie about what they diet. They don't report it. They write down the broccoli, 
they forget to write down the French fries and the scotch that followed on. You know, I mean, it's just that's how we are constituted. So um, dietary data is really hard to get by. I would I would imagine that also makes a difference. Other people argue for education as a benefit for social connectivity, but the data is sort of weaker and weaker as you go down that. But activity certainly, physical activity is great. We're back there. Absolutely, that the um, NYU caregiver intervention is specifically one that's being brought to scale, which is actually. I think you can, well, we haven't tried to do it, but I think taking, there are pretty big statewide interventions. That one's already been tried in the state of Minnesota. It's going to New York now. We haven't done that work yet. I do think that other nations that have really pushed for looking at better care for seniors have done a good job. The, the finger trial, I think, is, is that Norway? I know it's Scandinavia. Where's the finger? Yeah. Finland, Finland thank you. Um, so there are large groups where you can actually study and look at good data. It is doable. It's hard. Lifestyle change is brutally difficult. It's really tricky. And so we've often backed away from that. But actually, that's where the evidence is sort of pointing right now, that there is gain to be had there. So we need to like figure out how to get it together and try and do that. A very nitty gritty question regarding the feeding tubes. Yeah. I know that you can accomplish a lot by explaining to families that don't need to put patients on the schedule and feeding them. They're not necessarily active. Right. But there are some patients who do express hunger. Right. And whenever they're fed, they ask for it. No, it's very uncomfortable for some. Yeah, it's really tricky. So there are a lot of great um, people who work on foods that are easier um, for sort of thickened liquids, basically, a sort of milkshake kind of thing. It is very tricky. but. It's also true that at the end of life, we don't necessarily need to keep doing that. And I think you can go back and forth. You can give people the choice. It's a painful choice. But basically, you try to do little bites. You try and avoid the aspiration. And even, by the way, the symptoms of aspiration don't necessarily go away when you put somebody on a feeding tube. People are still getting pneumonia, still aspirating just their own secretions and stuff. So we can't get away with that dysfunction in the swallowing mechanism, even by putting somebody on a feeding tube. I think it is painful. The earlier we have that conversation, the more comforting we can be. And I think we can try and help people saying it's really, this is where we are now. I don't think the feeding tube is really helpful. Should continue to aspirate. You know, this is really the end stage. And how can we help keep you and her comfortable as we get there? But it's a brutal thing. I'm so glad you asked that question. This is one of my favorite questions. So um, in the book, yes, that was a little bit hard to hear. Um, this um, colleague is asking about pacemakers. What about that, pacemakers in dementia? So um, my mother was offered a pacemaker, and I write about that in the book. And after much struggle within the six siblings in my family, um, we decided not to. And it was really hard because the... Um, Physicians, I thought, were quite brutal about this, saying, you know, nobody dies of heart block. It's like, yeah, but she is dying, though, so, like, I'm not sure we care uh, which thing is going to beat, you know, to the, who's going to get to the finish line first. So we think about pacemakers, or some of us think about pacemakers as in a special category. It's just a little thing. It doesn't hurt. Why not do that? In fact, if somebody has a terminal illness, or as is true for many people with dementia, multiple terminal illnesses, 
you need to think about whether or not their suffering is such that they would not necessarily prefer to have their life extended. And it's a reasonable question to have with somebody with dementia. The end stage can include a great deal of suffering. So I think, and the guidelines for um, uh, cardiologists who put in pacemakers and LVADs and the like are consistent with this. And they will say it is perfectly appropriate to stop any treatment that is no longer serving its purpose. It actually turns out to be incredibly simple to turn off a pacemaker. You don't even really have to do much of a procedure. It's a wand. So you can turn it off. And then the person is not going to, it's not like a ventilator. You're not going to necessarily have a demise right then. It will, you know, unfold as whatever um, natural sort of arrhythmias are in there and existing. The person then may die of heart block or whatever else is on board. But I think that is a legitimate palliative concern. And it is appropriate to ask about a wide range of treatments that are ongoing. Is this medicine or device or intervention now helping this person? Let us re-examine today in the context of this patient's care, what is the burden benefit ratio? And is it in favor of keeping this treatment going? And if it's not, and this is clearly the end stage and consistent with that person's wishes, it's appropriate to stop it. The patients are not our prisoners. We don't have a right, like, I put it on there, now you can't take it off. It's like, what is that? That's not medicine. That's oppressive. No. Before our final question, remember, book reading tonight, literati. Don't come I know, I like that. Final question. I hope so. I think you're um, absolutely correct. Famously, the hospice guidelines are really um, focused on cancer care. That cancer was really the model that took us toward a hospice. Let's figure out how to provide good care at end of life for people with cancer. But dementia doesn't fit that model, doesn't fit that timeline. Dementia is much more variable in how long it takes to get to the point of demise. And it's variable within lots of different people. It's very hard to predict. And indeed, a person's suffering can be very considerable, and their function level can be very low um, for quite a long period with dementia. And it doesn't sort of, it can be 18 months, it could be two years. So it doesn't fit the hospice box that's there. So there are people that are arguing that we should have a different set of criteria for people with dementia. And that indeed, hospice care is actually consistent with excellent care, care that focuses on comfort, that focuses on quality of life. I love the hospice um, kind of motto, which is every remaining day should be a good day. Um, I think that that really is a good model. The other issue is that because of nursing home payments, those restrictions have gotten harder and not looser over time. They're wor really worried about spending more money which is largely covered by Medicaid in the states. So states want to decrease that. Unfortunately, it costs us more money overall because if you're not on hospice and you're sick, you go to the hospital, which costs instantly so much more than that extra six months on hospice would have cost. So it's a crazy policy. It's about not having a coherent national healthcare strategy that really sort of looks at the cost and the benefit overall and balances those appropriately. So I agree with you. I think it's a big gap in our current healthcare policy. Well, thank you once again, Dr. Paul, for a beautiful.